So I'm going to be handing off to the surgeon in chief of Duke Health, the chair of the Department of Surgery. We're privileged to have Dr. Alan Kirk here. He's one of our biggest champions in innovation and has really led a lot of initiatives to bring AI, ML, and all sorts of emerging technologies into healthcare. So welcome, Dr. Kirk. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm very privileged to have been asked uh, to do this talk. Um, these are my financial disclosures, the sources of funding and my commercial relationships. But my most important disclosure is that I'm a surgeon. Now, asking a surgeon to give a talk on machine learning or any type of learning for that matter may seem somewhat oxymoronic. Um, but I'm going to try to convince you that it's more appropriate than you think because surgeons invented healthcare and we have always used clinical decision support tools and everyone else is just catching up. Now, Surgery is a uniquely human thing. You can't do surgery without some things that are specific to humans. You know, dolphins are smart, but they don't do surgery. Chimpanzees can stand upright, but they don't do surgery. Surgery is a human defining thing. But I would argue that as soon as there were humans, surgery started. Probably the instinctive reach to a tribes person perhaps to put hands on a bleeding wound and stop the bleeding. But as soon as organisms could stand upright and use their hands and had enough cortical processing to imagine the value of helping other people, then surgery started. Now, that's a nice myth that I've made up for myself, but if you look at what is written, the earliest documents of healthcare, this is an example of that, the Edwin Smith papyrus, are all about surgery. The Edwin Smith papyrus doesn't talk about incantations or magic or anything. It talks about coming to the aid of people in tactile means. And it is a recounting of several cases of trauma, discussing the diagnosis the treatment and the prognosis of an illness. Um, this is essentially a clinical decision support tool. And if you read it, it's completely recognizable if you know hieroglyphics. Uh, there, there, there's nothing in here that a surgeon would look at and go, oh, that's wrong. That surgeons have had insight about what people need to stay alive for as long as there is recorded history, and I'm sure for longer. Throughout time, surgeons have used their personal understanding of injury and illness to help patients with the tools at hand. And I think the common defining trait of a great surgeon for most of history or long before is based on a personal understanding of disease, health, healing, achieved through tactile means for actually experiencing what is necessary. We are not only in the room with the patient, we are in the patient. We're in the room where it happens. And that's what ground truth is. So, as we start thinking about machine learning tools, artificial intelligence, neural networks, you all know that without ground truth, they're worthless. And so the role of surgeons and people like them is critical in the future of what you aspire for. Now, I have several biases. I'll try to expose them. First, I think there are few failures in medicine 
that are due to the size of the hole we make in people or how two things are sewn together. Technical issues have largely reached their asymptote. You know, getting one more micron better at sewing something together, probably not gonna be transformative. Um, good technique is critical, but the influence of technical innovations, new valves, new robots, probably not gonna transform healthcare. Most failures in healthcare have their foundation in three things. Biology, in other words, factual reality. Judgment, which is how you construct and organize the biological facts. And system errors, which is how you organize the organization of the biological facts. And it's in this order. If you have the biology wrong, you cannot correct that with some sort of system issue. And if you have the biology exactly right, but you can't deliver it, a major problem in American healthcare to be sure, you're not gonna solve it. You've gotta get these three things right. So this remains based on personal understanding of our experienced world, acting with the tools at hand, but not necessarily the tools in hand. Surgeons get very focused on tools they can hold but the most important tools are the tools that are available, not just things that are traditionally associated with surgical practice or medical practice or any practice. We should use it all to do what we wanna do and that's take care of other people. And all of this comes down to one thing, understanding reality, not virtual reality, but what is real. Now, that seems simple, but reality is not simple. It's not the same as simplicity. And one of the nicest articles I've ever read in pointing out what reality is, is this article by Herbert Simon, who won the Nobel Prize for coming up with a structured model of complexity. And what he said was that things evolve within structural planes because of the inherent evolutionary advantage of copying something that has already worked. So if you know something's worked, if you use that to make the next incremental step, that works pretty well and things will evolve like that. But everything doesn't evolve in the same plane, that there are many planes Within an evolutionary plane, prediction, planning, and control work because they've co-evolved. So you can assess risk, you have predictability, and it's a very transactional life. But the world is not one plane. There's multiple planes of evolution. And so interactions that go across hierarchical planes is what defines complexity. And that's where you come up with uncertainty and surprise and incompleteness and error. And these are not things that are wrong. They are inherent in trying to merge things together. So for example, taking care of someone who's had their spleen ruptured is something you can predict. The spleen is ruptured. You know what's going to happen. Here's how you manage that. But you can't predict when someone's going to have their spleen ruptured, unless, of course, you're looking at traffic patterns or have put that into your model. Those are two separate planes of information that make it difficult to actually have high fidelity in your initial model. Patterns form at a higher level on those in which patterns act. And so if you're actually gonna stand back and try to make predictions, you have to step outside of the plane that you have evolved in and then observe it. And to apply machine learning to healthcare, I think that this is an important model
they intersect, but they are still separate co-evolved things. And a way of dealing with uncertainty, incompleteness, and surprise is critically important to making machine learning work in the world in which I work. Now, this is a good example of what I'm talking about. Louis Pasteur invented the concept of infectious disease, essentially. He said that bugs grow and those bugs cause infection. Of course they do. Joseph Lister looked at that and go, said, of course, that's got to be right. So he took carbolic acid, which Pasteur had shown kills bugs. He applied carbolic acid to the surgical patient, the instruments, the hands, the wound, and showed that he could make wound infections go away. And everyone looked at that, taking two very separate things. Before this, every wound got infected. And it got infected so frequently with purulence and an odor that people thought that's how wounds heal. If there's no purulence, there won't be any wound healing. So this was counterintuitive to them. But they looked at this and they said, well, that's great. You should get the Nobel Prize. No, that's not at all what happened. In fact, if you go 15 years later and look at the greatest surgeon in, American, in America at that time, he basically said, this is crazy. Washing your hands and cleaning your instruments, that makes no sense. If you go even farther, almost 20 years after the discovery and go to the American Surgical Association, every surgeon from every state stood up and said, this is crazy. There's no such thing as bugs. We can't see them. We can't feel them. It's made up. It took 30 years for people to remember to wash their hands before they did surgery. Actually, textbooks from the 1880s suggest that you hold the suture in your mouth so you can get to it quickly. Two separate planes. Biology's correct, but the assimilation of that biology across separate planes kept it from being implemented. So we want change in healthcare, but we don't want to change in healthcare. And you're going to face that in everything that you do, because people can't see what you do. They don't have that tactile bias. So a lot of people say data are reality. You all deal in data. The data are the key to the future. If we get enough data, we've got this. I would argue that information is probably the key to the future, not data. That information is reality. And there is a real difference between information and data. Another good article to read is the work of Claude Shannon, who basically came up with the concept of noise and signal that the difference between data and information are information is what you really want to say and data is that and all the noise. And compressing the noise out of the data is how you get information conveyed in a meaningful way. Anyone who's read a medical record knows that there's way more data than there is information. And in fact, a lot of what's in there is just fiction. 40% of what's in a medical record is just wrong. All right, so what are the predominant challenges? Uh, we are dealing in complex, multi-specialty, for me, surgical practices, but medical practices that are increasingly focused on value-based care delivery. As Mark said, we're not great at value. There's an increasing need for well-quantified, actionable measures of quality, an increasing need to reduce patient costs, increased needs for reduced institutional costs, and there's increased complexity propelling the need for clinical decision support across separately evolved planes. We are dealing with distributed, multidisciplinary, clinical, translational, and basic research enterprises. 
There's an increasingly broad geographic footprints for clinical trial enrollment and conduct, increasingly large and complex mechanistic and clinical data sets, increased need to integrate multi-dimensional data sets. For example, taking an electronic medical record and merging it with sequence data from uh, uh, someone's DNA sequence. Two definitely co-evolved systems of information. We are dealing with large operational enterprises. There's increasing diverse operational management challenges, an increased focus on minimization of variation, but recognizing that the patients are pretty varied, an increased patient volume and flow, stretching the capacity and the workforce. That has never been more true than now. The entire economy has reset with regard to workforce availability. And all of this is nested in a changing society. There's increased disparity, increased diversity, and through both of those, increased conflict and competition. And all of these are data intensive. There's an increased amount of data from numerous different sources, traditional, EMRs, non-traditional, purchase uh, records from Walmart, trying to put those together. And these non-integrated data assets are things that we have to deal with. How do we store them, structure them, vi visualize them, uh, determine their relevance and their plausibility? I think this is really the, the most challenging part of what you do. It's it's finding the relevance and plausibility in the data. So what's the strategy? Well, the first is that we have to, as clinicians, become experts in prospective data capture and pair this with experiential, like surgical, clinical expertise to curate meaningful information out of all the noise. I think as surgeons, or any interventionalist, we have to focus on technical mastery as a variable and train people very early to have technical competency so that that doesn't become one of the surprising variables in what you're trying to do. You have to assume that people are technically good for your clinical decision support tools to ever work. We should focus on disease mechanisms and process. Now, in our department of surgery, you would think the biggest division is the division of gallbladder surgery or the division of trauma or whatever. Actually, our biggest division is our surgical sciences division. We do vaccine development, gene therapy, immunobiology. That's the foundation on which everything we do works. It's not new ways of taking the gallbladder out through a smaller hole. And we need to develop competency in clinical decision support because there is so much noise, so much data, and so much information that the ability for a human to calculate and move with that in real time is gone. We cannot assimilate everything that is out there to help us care for patients by ourselves. So data curation is critical. Getting data to be available is the first step. Doing it at a low cost, determining its relevance, determining the decision's plausibility, and standardizing it so it's generalizable is what is necessary. Now, how have we done that in our department? We have a large multidisciplinary department of surgery, um, which is by most metrics pretty competent. Um, we have separated how we assimilate data into experts. So the Scissors Substrate Services Corps is the group that goes to the bedside and takes specimens. You think, well, why should you be specialized in that? Well, if you are going to take a blood sample from someone and the way you draw the blood is different, depending on what time of day or what patient it is, there's a variable that you will never see in any of your models 
that will completely eliminate, it'll add surprise and unpredictability to your models. So we have a group that that's their job is take the specimens, standardize it, process it so that that variable is gone. We have a group, a surgical outcomes uh, or sur surgical office for clinical research, which standardizes the way that patients are enrolled, that goes to the bedside, enrolls patients in trials, enters the relevant trial data in a standardized way. So at least that transactional thing is no longer a surprising variable. And we build databases through a structured data management group so that at least within our department, the way data are put together is reasonably standardized. And then we use that data with explicit interest groups that become expert in either direct use of real-time clinical data, the LTA, um, stands for Laboratory for Transformative Administration, which was another oxymoron, of course, um, or this outcomes research group, which is specialized in looking at large multi-center data sets uh, and non-traditional data sets. And of course, we have partnered with the Duke Institute for Health Innovation, one of the groups that is helping sponsor this project or this program to make sure that we are receiving the best real-time data feeds that we can. And it's this level of compartmentalization and specialization that helps us do things with less concern about transactional aspects across planes. We want to establish robust ground truth. The most important feature of data-driven decisions is a good quality data. The information extraction requires deep subject matter expertise, but not just medical subject matter expertise, but subject matter expertise on how the data are being acquired, transformed, and utilized. There needs to be attention to the source data, what really came We want to centralize data capture, focus on people, not eliminate people, because it's people that go there, not just when we want it to be, but 24 seven. So this process is a 24 seven, 365 process. It is groups of people like this that require the investment to make these tools work. So we want to put all the people needed to retrieve, curate, analyze, implement data-intensive projects together, create a source of real-time data on tap, bring forward real-world problems to act on them, approach these problems with scientific rigor the same way we would any other laboratory experiment, and specifically intend to test and, when appropriate, implement those solutions in the health system. There are lots of things that we can think about with this. Simple issues like CPT codes, which you will put into a model, don't consider all of these things which will change that CPT code. Like which surgeon did the case? And was the case actually the case that was done? If you look at just how you capture data about surgical site infections, if you do it based on medical record numbers, and EMR and do it based on a curated human going to see whether the wound was infected, there's a 100% difference in the occurrence of surgical site infections solely based on how you acquire the data. And you can't build a model with 100% variability. It's not a very useful model. But when you do, then you can actually change healthcare. As we implemented this system in our department, we were able to identify wound infection problems and then fix them. Real improvements in healthcare. Now, getting real-time data curation is very difficult. I'm not gonna speak 
to any detail of that, but it is complicated. I mean, just re measuring creatinine in our hospital, there are 18 different creatinines, and the things that were creatinines last week are not the same things that are gonna be creatinine next week. That having the ability to work through real-time changes in data, like switching from ICD-9 to ICD-10, if you're not monitoring that all the time, your data feeds are not useful. So one of the things that we've benefited greatly from, from Duke Institute of Health Innovation is a real-time data pipeline that we can trust and we can give it to our surgeons and they have access to it so they can start making good assumptions based on the source data to make clinical decision prediction tools, to use those prediction tools in the processes of bringing a patient to surgery, collaborating with our anesthesia colleagues, for example, and actually just doing simple things like making sure that the case that was posted in the OR is actually the case that was done. Because if this single fact is wrong, and it is actually wrong about 30% of the time, then all of these other things are going to be wrong. And you can't work through it. We have worked pretty aggressively in trying to find the, the nuances that make these things more or less correct. And we can talk about that uh, later. We are doing the same types of things in projects in trauma with the Department of Defense, not just taking administrative data sets, but actually pulling biological data sets into them to integrate biological assays with EMR type data uh, to develop better ways of caring for people in very unpredictable settings like battle. And indeed, you can line up military trauma data sets with civilian trauma data sets and then interpolate them into non-trauma civilian healthcare. And actually, you find the biology lines up pretty easily. And so once you start seeing the assimilation of data in this way, you start being able to get much more out of it than you thought. I'll skip a little bit farther, except for to say that we are trying to now implement this type of approach to every surgery we do to really define human injury writ large, as opposed to just human surgery. But what is injury in humans and how do humans behave when they are injured? Can we generalize this into much broader things than just whether we're taking the gallbladder out at the right time? You can do this across many core processes in the OR. And indeed, we continue to try to develop machine learning models to help us predict how to get people to the OR at the right time, what happens to them in the OR, how do we get them to the hospital quickly, how do we get them back to the clinic? This is applicable to all of these things. We've worked with machine learning models. Uh, one that we've worked with very help, has been very helpful is the IQ model that basically is like open table for surgeons to help them get into the operating room when they want and predict the times that they'll spend there. And I think the biggest example of this is a project from surgical safety technologies uh, developed by Terry Grantroff that is attempting to integrate all data streams, including EMR and streaming data, but also what people are saying in the operating room and what the air temperature is in the OR. Everything that you can capture in the OR to bring to bear on improving outcomes, similar to the black box that's inside of an airplane. The, we need a black box in the OR, and that's in fact what this project is, is called. So the surgeon's proximity to their subject matter, the fact that they're in the room is rooted in experiential knowledge and concrete reality-based problem solving. And that is our greatest asset. And it will be your greatest asset if you partner with those people. Surgeons are experts at working with incomplete, time-sensitive, evolving data because they see, they feel, they smell, they hear reality. And you can't do anything without reality. Now, it is also a curse because it leads surgeons to be somewhat transactional and uniplanar, uh, and they're satisfied with incremental progress, but we can get past that. 
But in summarizing, I would say that the future of surgery and in medicine broadly will move faster than it has in the past. And it will be driven not by isolated technical competency, but integration of other planes into our practice, biology, sociology. People are going to resist this continuously. That's just what people do. But we need to train our clinicians to understand the world beyond the immediate task before them and train data sciences to link their data to reality. These two things are the key. Surgery will increasingly be focused on objective assessment of quality, cost, and access. And that's going to be dependent on looking at information as opposed to just data. Decision support is going to be increasingly important. Uh, we need to interface with and understand clinical decision support tools. And the appreciation of reality will remain critical. Surgeons and computer scientists have to meet at reality. At the end, though, a personal understanding of disease integrated in the complexity of the world will be key. Thank you very much.